So uh, my name is Greg Hisroth. I'm with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Illinois Natural History Survey. Um, my co-presenters are Elizabeth Fizzyberg and Amanda Hugelman. I'm an aquatic invasive species outreach specialist. I've been with Sea Grant since 2012. Um, I'm going to talk about what we do a little bit. Um, so, but first, if you're not familiar with uh, sea Grant. So Sea Grant is under the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. It is a partnership with land grant universities. So for Illinois, Indiana, that would be um, University of Illinois and Purdue University. So kind of what we want to do is essentially take multiple stakeholders, so anyone who has um, some stake in the Great Lakes, um, and take their opinions and then uh, take that information and provide education outreach uh, to empower those communities to do uh, things for the environment and the economy. So essentially we are neutral mediators among multiple stakeholders. Um, the other hat I wear is with the Illinois Natural History Survey, which has collected biological resources uh, information um, from the state of Illinois for many years, over 100. And then part of their mission is to take that information and provide it to the public to provide a better understanding of um, these resources. So really two words that are in both of these descriptions is outreach. And so that's what we do, that's what I do is outreach. And I specifically focus on aquatic invasive species. So some examples that uh, most people probably have heard about uh, to help orient what we do um, are sea lamprey, zebra mussels, and Asian carp. And this is an image specifically about silver carp. So um, these are all things that are pretty um, well known in this region. Um, but before I get into that, I want to kind of make the distinction between weeds and pests or invasive because this is something that um, I hear quite a bit while doing outreach um, is whether or not someone has a species in their yard or in their pond and they think it's invasive. Um, so I like to refer to this model a lot down the bottom. Um, so a species has to be transported, introduced, established, spread, and then have impact to be considered invasive um, as far as I'm concerned. So transportation essentially is human mediated means of moving species from one location to an area where it's never been before. Then introducing it actually means introducing it into an environment, establish, uh, be able to grow or reproduce in that environment, spread unaided to uh, other areas uh, or other environments, and then impact. So that's economic, environmental, or even related to health of humans or wildlife. And so really, if someone has a weed or a pest in their backyard versus invasive, this is how I make that distinction, is typically just the impacts. Um, so this is an image of Chicago Botanic Garden employees pulling water lettuce and water hyacinth out of the Skokie Lagoons. Um, so this is an example of a species that is internationally, or two species that are internationally known to be quite invasive. However, because of our cold winters in the Midwest, they actually died back. But there is still some debate whether or not they are invasive. They are definitely obnoxious when they are introduced into water, but whether or not they're going to have those same impacts. So these are just kind of the thoughts that we have when we talk about invasive species, especially for aquatic systems. So examples that I mentioned previously is sea lamprey. Um, so how do they get transported here? Typically, uh, people say uh, canals. So the enhancement of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and then the creation of the Welland Canal. So Welland Canal, if you're not familiar, bisects or bypasses Niagara Falls. Um, so Niagara Falls is a very tricky thing to swim up for um, sea lamprey, which is an eel-like organism. And so by creating this shipping canal, uh, the Welland Canal, um, we were able to see the sea lamprey go from Lake Ontario into the upper Great Lakes. Um, so this is one way in which we've mediated or uh, the movement of invasive, aquatic invasive species. Ballast water is another common example that people are pretty familiar with hearing. Uh, so large cargo ships have to put on large heavy pieces of cargo and take them off. And to balance out the adding or removing, they pull in a lot of water um, from ports to balance out that cargo. Um, and with that water, organisms go with it. Uh, so zebra mussels and quagga mussels, uh, which Amanda Hegelman will talk about later, um, are one example of how they were introduced to the Great Lakes um, from the Pontocaspian region of Europe. Um, and so essentially uh, what this is, is that all this water goes in and then comes out to new locations. So species are being um, transported and introduced. Um, just a little side note, ballast water um, is pretty well regulated at the moment. So most water when it's pumped um, from ports now has to be uh, expelled uh, mid-ocean. And so you're not getting the same um, bio load as we used to get. 
Uh, introducing species intentionally, uh, transforming species intentionally, such as biocontrol agents in catfish pond. So Asian carp are introduced to control algae and pests in catfish ponds. And then some natural flooding um, uh, washed them out of those ponds into public waterways where they are now potentially or known to be invasive. And so these are examples of which species have been moved around by people. Um, mostly of my work focuses on ornamental ponds and um, aquariums. So these are species that are being transported for the purpose of um, making people's lives more interesting. So water gardens or aquariums. Um, and so water garden animals and plants um, have escaped from um, their intended habitat and been introduced into natural environments. So some things like Hydrilla verticillata, which is an aquatic plant. If you ever bought a fake plant for your aquarium, this is typically what it looks like. It's a very brittle plant. So if you get this on a pond somewhere and you try to remove it by hand pulling, it's gonna break apart. And those fragments can actually regrow new plants. Um, they also set down tubers, uh, these yellow things on the right in the sediment, and then actually do reproductive, uh, asexual reproduction through turions, so vegetative buds. And so these are pretty widespread, um, Hydrilla verticillata. Uh, we're finding populations in Illinois now. Florida, um, a few years ago, estimated that they spend about $78 million on control costs and removal of Hydrilla. Um, water chestnut was an ornamental plant that was introduced through a botanic garden in Canada. Um, it's not known to be in the uh, Midwest, but in the Eastern states, um, a water chestnut has been known to happen or occur. Um, so it's a floating plant that produces a four-pronged barbed nutlet on the left. Um, this is not the um, what you eat in Chinese food. That's L.A. Ocarus dulcis. So this is just another water chestnut. Um, but it's an ornamental plant. So essentially what it does is it creates this really heavy Chill cover. On me. Pardon me? <laughs> um, and so it creates a, a system in which um, oxygen is depleted and kills the fish below it. Um, so water chestnut is uh, not known to be a problem here, but has been known to be a problem throughout the other states. Purple loosestrife is one that it was an ornamental in trade since the 1800s, brought over from Europe. Uh, if you ever drive around in the Midwest and you see this fuchsia bright color on the side of the road, it's probably purple loosestrife. Mostly it spreads through sexual reproduction through um, seed set. And so really, uh, right now there's a beetle that was introduced as a biocontrol, which controls the seed set, eats the flowers, but the vegetative body doesn't die back necessarily. And so that's not a huge problem as much as it used to be, but it's still an example of an ornamental that has escaped and has caused problems. So this is, a infested, this is the basis species curve. Um, so on the bottom is time. So if you follow the arrow to the right, as time increases, area infest, in, infested increases on the left. And then on the right is, um, gosh, uh, control costs. And so pretty much what this means, as time goes on, area infested increases and so do control costs. So if you see that blue arrow on the bottom left-hand side for introduction, um, that's when a species is introduced. And going back to that model, species are transported here intentionally or accidentally and then introduced. So if we can prevent that introduction of species, um, then we actually uh, don't have all that long-term resource protection that we have to um, participate in. So sea lamprey is an example of resource protection and long-term management. Um, so every year about $12 million is invested into controlling sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. Um, so this is much more uh, cost-effective to do the prevention side of things instead of trying to remove things once they've been established. Um, so a quote along that line is a species is established, uh, impacts grow over time and space and are usually irreversible in perpetuity. So often invasive species, once you have them, you have them forever. Um, they don't usually go a lot away by their own. Um, and even if you are able to control or remove them, typically you don't get the same ecosystem back that you started with. And so really uh, we focus on prevention for that purpose because it's very effective for managing populations. Um, so we do things like we partner with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources uh, to create the Be Hero Release Zero campaign. So we are asking people to fight the spread of aquatic invaders by doing some simple disposal behaviors uh, when they have water gardens or aquariums or even live bait or any other organisms that they buy or sell. So really we focus on plants, animals, and water. So we suggest people put their unwanted plants and place them in the trash in a bag. 
animals, uh, find a new owner, or uh, work with a veterinarian to seek uh, humane disposal. And then water, disinfect, or repurpose. We have a lot of this information on our website, releasezero.org. But to dive a little bit more deeply into that, so why do we say put your plants in a bag, in a trash, why not just compost them? Well, the reason is that if you don't kill all the vegetative body or the seeds, um, and then you take that compost and you move it around, then you're spraying around the same problem. So if you ever had weeds in your yard that you didn't want, and you composted them, you didn't kill the seeds, when you spread around that compost, you're spreading them around. Or if you have your compost in an area that may be prone to being washed away, um, if you're in a flood prone area. So really, this is what we are suggesting for plants, especially these plants that you know are slightly problematic. Um, for water, really, we don't want people to dump water into storm drains, which are often untreated. Um, in some municipalities, if you flush water um, and down your toilet or down a sink, and it happens to be a combined um, sewage system uh, with stormwater, I and mean, it happens to be raining, you could potentially have that water make it untreated to water bodies. So really, we suggest a little bit of bleach for water, um, or even repurposing it, such as watering your lawn or um, your plants with it. Um, those are nice internal things you can do inside your house. A little bit more difficult is actually finding a new owner or finding um, advice on humane disposal. Um, and so to help with that, we've actually worked on this website called takeaim.org, which is aquatic invaders in the marketplace. So this is a catch-all for uh, organisms that are bought, sold, or traded. Um, so we have this uh, in the yellow circle, the alternatives to pet release. It's a list of organizations that will take back unwanted pets or will actually, uh, there are also a list of veterinarians that will help you care for your pets or take care of your pets. Um, if you're interested in what you can or cannot buy in certain states, um, we have state and federal regulations available. So this is uh, important, especially if you're selling or buying things online. Um, it's hard to make sure that every online retailer has uh, current information. So we try to get um, consumers to want to uh, seek this information as well. And then we also have lists of non-invasive alternatives, uh, mostly because we know that some species are slightly or potentially problematic but regulation doesn't always work or um, are not regulated for certain reasons. And so we try to um, help consumers make choices about which species to choose. Um, so an example of that is a couple publications. So this is a poster you'll see on the left. This is a probably about a two foot tall poster that we hang up in water garden retail shops or nurseries. And then on the right is a brochure. Um, the top right is the outside of the brochure and then the bottom right is the inside. On the inside, you'll see grow these non-invaders. Um, these are a list of species that are likely to be low risk or um, are native. When I say risk, I, these are species that have been put through a risk assessment. So looking at biological characteristics to see if they're high risk or low risk for invasion. Um, so this risk assessment was done by uh, researchers at Notre Dame and Lyell in Chicago. Um, this is called the Notre Dame Stair Tool. And you can find it on takeaim.org. Um, and so the high risk species we have um, below is avoid these invaders. And so these species are either uh, considered uh, high risk or known to be invasive. And so essentially we're just trying to guide people away from certain species that are in trade that could be potentially problematic. Um, so why do we care so much about this? Again, um, the likelihood of new invaders expands with uh, increases in trade. Uh, on the bottom left hand, um, this is a old image, it's not like today or like the last couple months, but typically people move things around a lot, so people or goods. Um, so this is an image of every flight for one day around the world, and so people are very good about moving things around. So the likelihood of new species being transported to the US is high, um, but we also have uh, another effect of climate change. So with warming winters, or potentially warming winters, um, we'll see the door open for tropical or subtropical species. Um, and so things that we think won't be able to survive here, like water hyacinth or water lettuce, I mentioned previously, might change in the future with warmer winters without that nice cold Chicago winter or the Illinois winters. Um, so it's of, of concern in the future. Um, and also, again, ballast water, um, it's pretty well regulated right now, and so the organism and trade pathway is seen as one of the more unique ways in which species are being introduced into the Great Lakes region. Um, as of right now, there's 187 known non-invasive species established in the Great Lakes. Um, so this is through the Great Lakes Aquatic Nuisance Species Information System, or GLANSIS. 
Um, so these are not all invasive species. Some of them have actually been introduced intentionally, um, like so some salmonids um, into the Great Lakes for sport fishing. Um, but about a quarter of these um, have been suspected to have been introduced through the organism trade pathway. So the intentional bringing in species here for ornamental purposes or other purposes such as bait. Um, so it is of uh, known concern and a known problem. Um, and so this is why we focus on this pathway a little bit. Um, and we do outreach, uh, typical outreach that you consider uh, when you think about outreach, like we go and talk to clubs, we have booths at trade shows, um, we do talks like this. Um, but we also have embraced the digital age and created uh, social media ads as well as uh, short PSAs to be played online. And so really those are our efforts for aquarium and water garden stuff. Um, um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda, oh, I'm sorry, Busy, to talk a bit about some other things that we do within our office. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves, so. Cool, okay, so this is Busy talking now. Um, just gonna share my screen. Great. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Berg, or most of the time I go by Busy, uh, and I'm an Aquatic Invasive Species Outreach Assistant with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and PRI. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit about invasive crayfish as well as some of our outreach efforts that we have um, going on. So just to start out, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, what are crayfish? So crayfish go by a number of different names depending on where you are in the country. Um, so this map shows kind of the regionality of the different names in the south where, that's, um, where the map is all red, they call them crawfish. In the blue areas, that's where they're called crayfish. And then those green areas are where they're called crawdads. And so really, no matter what you call crayfish, they are all the same little creature. Um, and they are arthropods, they are invertebrates, so they have that hard exoskeleton that they have to shed. Um, and they are part of the crustacean group. So they are related to shrimps, they're related to lobsters, related to crabs. And there are about 620 species of crayfish worldwide. So that number is changing as scientists discover new species or describe different uh, differences between species. So crayfish have pretty important roles in the environment. They are freshwater species, so they live in aquatic or semi-aquatic areas. They um, need their gills to stay wet in order to breathe oxygen, but unlike fish, they can walk around on land for a little while, as long as their gills are staying wet. Um, they are what's called ecosystem engineers, and this is largely because they create these burrows. So an ecosystem engineer is an is a organism that really changes the environment that it's living in in, in a um, dramatic way, and crayfish do this by burrowing. So on the right, I have some images, um, some drawings of crayfish burrows. They will burrow down past the water table so that they can get into an area where their gills will stay wet. Um, and they, they kind of live in there as well as um, spend some time in there. And so you can tell if you have a crayfish in your region or your, your area, um, if you can see those little crayfish chimneys coming up where the, where the burrow is. Um, and so these burrows really change the environment that they're living in. They, uh, they aerate the soil, they provide drainage in the soil, they can also change the stability of stream banks and pond banks and really affect the, the whole environment that these crayfish live in. Crayfish are also really important for their uh, food webs, so they are omnivorous to tritivores, which means that they eat plants and animals and they eat dead or decaying plants or animals. Um, so they kind of act as the recycler in food webs they um, are important prey for a lot of different organisms, whether that be birds or reptiles, amphibians, and fish as well. So sport fish often eat crayfish as well. So crayfish can be found natively on every continent except for Africa and Antarctica. And this map shows 
where you can find different crayfish species around the world. So the darker blue colors show more crayfish diversity or more crayfish species and the lighter blue shows less. Um, and you can see that they're found in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, but there's really a hot spot of crayfish biodiversity in the United States. However, many of the crayfish species around the world are declining or at risk of extinction. And so two examples of crayfish that have declining populations um, in our region, in the, in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes areas, are the leopard crayfish on the left, which is endangered, and the unarmed crayfish on the right, which is a vulnerable species. And so you can kind of get an idea of why the United States has such a hot spot of crayfish bi biodiversity by looking at how small the native range is for these crayfish. So these maps show a grayed out region where you can find these crayfish natively, and you can see that there's, it's a really small area that they're natively found. And so that kind of gives an idea of why these populations might be declining as well as why we have such a, a biodiverse area. And so then kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum is invasive species. And so invasive species are those that are non-native and rapidly colonizing the ecosystem. And so one example is the crayfish on the left, which is a red swamp crawfish, um, which is a really aggressive invader. These invasive crayfish species cause a lot of problems, so they threaten our native crayfish biodiversity, like those two species that I just talked about. Um, they do this by outcompeting native species for food and other resources, whether that be just by being more efficient at eating or more efficient at reproducing, or um, directly competing with, with those native crayfish species. So crayfish are known to actually fight with one another, and invasive crayfish are typically more aggressive than the native species that we have. In addition, crayfish can destroy and degrade ecosystems with their burrowing. So like I mentioned earlier, they're ecosystem engineers, but if they come to an ecosystem where there are typically not crayfish or typically far fewer crayfish, they can really change that ecosystem in a negative way. They can also disrupt food chains and disrupt fisheries. And so in this way, crayfish, invasive crayfish species can cause not only environmental or ecological problems, but also really uh, economic problems as well. And so we cover in our office a few different pathways of introduction. So these are ways that crayfish are introduced to new environments, invasive species are introduced to new environments. Um, and so the main ways that crayfish invaders are introduced that we focus on are bait, aquariums, classrooms, and aquatic farming or food. And so for bait, oftentimes fisher people like to use crayfish, live crayfish as bait, uh, but this can become problematic if that crayfish escapes from the, from the hook that it's on or if at the end of the day the fisher person decides to release all of its live bait to the environment that they were fishing in. This can create new populations of invasive species in that area. Additionally, crayfish make really good aquarium pets or classroom pets because they're really hardy, they're really interesting to watch, um, they eat a lot of different things. But if at the end of the time with that pet you decide you don't want it anymore and you release it into the environment, this can potentially create a new population of invasive species, um, which even just releasing one individual has the potential to start a new population as, as the females are known to store fertilized eggs and store sperm within their bodies for uh, extended periods of time. And then lastly, aquatic farming and food. I have this picture of a crawfish boil. Um, oftentimes crawfish are brought in live and boiled live. And so if they were to escape from, from that uh, situation, they might create new populations. Um, and new invasive populations, as well as aquatic farming if they were to escape from aquaculture tanks, um, they could start new populations. And so a few examples of crayfish that are in our area or crayfish that we look at with our team. Um, I'm going to show some of these USGS maps and on these maps you can see 
The orange shows the native range of that crayfish species, and then the reds and the pinks show introduced areas, so where that crayfish is not native but has been found living in the environment. And so in the Midwest, in our Great Lakes states, we have natively the Bural crayfish, but it is um, found introduced in other parts of the United States. We also have natively the calico crayfish, but we have some invasive species as well. So the rusty crayfish is um, really clear. You can really obviously tell what the rusty crayfish looks like by having this little rusty spot on it, but this is an invasive species in the Great Lakes. Um, and so it has come from areas of Indiana and Ohio and started to spread in um, the Great Lakes states. Another example of an invasive species to the Great Lakes is the red swamp crayfish or the red swamp crawfish, which is native to the Gulf Coast states, um, but has become increasingly invasive in our area and really across the world. So this red swamp crawfish has caused a lot of problems in Asia, a lot of problems in Europe, um, and has really been a, a highly invasive species around the world. Um, and we're starting to find it more and more in the Great Lakes states and in our region. So we're hoping to slow the spread of this invasive species and, and potentially stop it. Um, but this is one of those new invaders that we have. Um, if we think about that figure that Greg showed earlier, this is kind of on the earlier, the left hand side of that, of that invasive species curve. So we still have the chance to potentially um, stop this, this spread of this invasive species without too much um, cost. And then some examples of potential invaders. So these are species that are not yet in the United States and we're hoping to keep them that way. So one example is the common yabby or the Cherix destructor. This is a crayfish species that is commonly found, is native to parts of Australia. So you can see on that map, that red portion is where it's natively found and those yellow highlighted countries are where it has been introduced. Um, and so this species is actually listed on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, injurious species list. And so it, we are actively regulating against having this invasive species in the United States. Um, and one of the reasons we're thinking, predicting that this would be a really harmful potential invader is strictly its size. So it is so big, it could really uh, have the potential to outcompete our native species. Another example of a potential invader that's not in the United States but could be in the future is the marbled crayfish or the marmocrabs. This is a really interesting species. So it's actually not natively found anywhere. It is entirely bred from in captivity. It is bred and created, the species was created for aquarium trade. So it's a really common aquarium pet. Um, that's not natively found anywhere. But on this map, you can see the points show different populations that are either established or where individuals have been found out in the wild. And so this marbled crayfish is really common in aquarium trade. Um, we're predicting that its likely pathway of introduction would be from the release of aquarium pets. Um, and it's really an interesting species not only because it's not found natively anywhere, but also because they're all clones of one another. So they're all of these individuals are female and they reproduce by parthenogenesis. So they reproduce asexually and they don't need a mate. And so what that means is just one individual has the potential to really create a whole new population. Um, so this is something that we're definitely on the lookout for as a potential invader. And then some of our outreach efforts so we have a few different outreach efforts specifically looking at crayfish and how we can prevent the spread of invasive crayfish species. Um, some of the ones I've been working on are the monitoring program and the work, workshops. So we have a crayfish monitoring program, which is a community science program, um, hoping to, to look at those educators as instead of a pathway of introduction, 
potentially helping us to uh, reduce the spread of aquatic invasive species, reduce the spread of crayfish by monitoring their uh, local ecosystems. And so the thought is with this monitoring program, we'll have community science program where classrooms can help prevent the spread of invasive species. And so we hold workshops where we train educators and teachers how to sample for crayfish with their students. So they'll be able to go out and trap or kick net or seine net um, with their students and look for the whatever crayfish diversity can be found in their um, nearby aquatic ecosystems. And so on that picture on the left, you can see some of our aquatic invasive species team doing some seine netting. Um, and then also in our workshops, we teach educators how to identify different crayfish species as well as report different crayfish species. So we use iNaturalist as our method of reporting crayfish. Um, and I'll show you this little screenshot of iNaturalist. I think iNaturalist is a really great tool. Um, it allows us to have a really precise location of where that crayfish was found. We have um, the, the educators and the students can then suggest what they believe they found so they can take pictures and say, I think that, I think with my IDing skills that I found this specific creature, but since it's an online platform and it's a, a public platform, um, we can invite experts in the field to come and help out. And so, for example, on this page, we have um, the person who found the crayfish suggest an identification. And then we have um, that ID rust bug suggest an ID of White River crayfish. That is a collaborator that we have in Michigan who's actually an expert in crayfish and really knows what he's talking about when it comes to crayfish identification. And so he's able to come on and say, yeah, I agree with you. You were right. That is the, the species of crayfish that you found here. And so this is a really great tool. We'll be able to um, potentially find new or we're asking teachers to monitor their, their local ecosystems for potential new invasive crayfish species populations. Um, so we'll be able to tackle the problem before it gets too out of hand. And then some, some of our other outreach efforts that we have ongoing, we have some outreach tools. So we have things like signage and stickers and, and, and brochures targeting those other audiences like, anglers. Um, and so, for example, we have our Don't Dump Bait campaign. We have some websites. So we have our, the clip I have here is from the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative website, which you can find at invasivecrayfish.org. Um, this has helped to fund that monitoring program and helped to fund those workshops that we've, we've held. Um, and on this website, you can see a bunch of information about invasive crayfish, as well as um, research that's ongoing, prevention and management. Um, and then we have some other websites as well. So Take Aim, Transport Zero, um, just giving some, some information about invasive crayfish. And then lastly, we hold webinars like the, the one we're um, taking part in right now, but we also host some webinars occasionally. Um, and so we're really hoping to to connect scientists to those that are interested in learning more about invasive crayfish. And so our webinars are all recorded. If you're interested in learning more about invasive crayfish, you can find them at the invasivecrayfish.org website um, if you're interested in learning more about invasive crayfish. Um, and so that's all I have. I'll hand it off to Amanda now. And if you have any questions, you can just write them in the chat box and we'll try to get to them uh, at the end of all of these presentations. So thanks. Thanks, Busy. And I will, this is Amanda, I will go ahead and share my screen with you all now. Okay, um, so my name is Amanda Hugelman. I am also an aquatic invasive species outreach assistant with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Illinois Natural History Survey. And I'll just be discussing some of the history, ecology, and impacts of zebra and quagga mussels in the Great Lakes region, and then share with you all some of the ways our team connects with boaters and anglers and other recreational water users through our outreach. So zebra and quagga mussels are dry synods, 
They are part of a group of small freshwater bivalves that are native to Eastern Europe in and around the Black and Caspian Seas. And these were inadvertently transported to North America in the late 1980s via ballast water and transatlantic shipping, like Greg was mentioning earlier. Um, these mussels get their names from the striping pattern on their shells, although individual color morphs can vary widely. Um, there are populations of quagga mussels in Lake Erie noted to be almost completely white, which is where um, genetic testing might come in handy to really discern these two, two species. Um, zebra mussels are D-shaped. They have this flattened underside where they attach to different substrates, while quagga mussels are more rounded. Um, both species are capable of really rapidly growing and spreading their populations. A mature female, which typically starts producing eggs in its second year, uh, can produce up to 1 million eggs per spawning season. And their microscopic larvae seen here called belligers can really easily go undetected um, in water left in your bait buckets or in the bottom of your boat or other equipment. And after these belligers mature to a certain stage, they can begin attaching onto surfaces using what are called bissel threads, which are these thin um, rope-like threads that really tightly adhere the muscle to its surface. Uh, zebra muscle juveniles will typically attach to harder substrates while quaggas can colonize both hard and soft surfaces such as the sand and silt on the bottom of a lake bed. And so this is a, a distribution map of zebra and quagga mussel sightings as of August 2019. Uh, since the introduction of these mussels to the Great Lakes region, they've really rapidly spread throughout this area. And uh, by 1990, zebra mussels were found in all of the Great Lakes. And by 2005, quagga mussel sightings were confirmed in each lake as well. And then in 2007, quagga mussel population was discovered in Lake Mead here on the Colorado River in Nevada. Um, and while these mussels spread initially throughout the Great Lakes, mainly via connected waterways, uh, this population in Lake Mead is likely thought to have been introduced by a contaminated boat, bringing them from an infested lake. But if we focus on Illinois and Lake Michigan, uh, we can see that zebra mussels dominate Illinois major rivers as compared to zebra and quaggas, although, although they are both seen here. Um, both mussels are really good at passively spreading in water currents, especially in their villager stages. But the invasive mussels also um, hitch rides on boats and other equipment being moved over land, both as villagers and as adult um, organisms. And this really facilitates their spread inland throughout our Illinois lakes and rivers. Um, the mussels can stay alive in very small amounts of water and under certain conditions can live outside of water for several days at a time. Um, and in Lake Michigan, particularly, quagga mussels uh, really surpassed the zebra mussel populations here. And now they make up the vast majority of dry synods in the lake, um, partly because quagga mussels are able to colonize deeper and cooler water, which helps them to outcompete the zebra mussels. And Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, among some other partners, helped to produce this neat online tool um, that shares results of some research done through the Cooperative Science and Monitoring Initiative, which really closely monitors each lake. And so you can find more information on the impacts of these mussels and others in this, this tool. Um, okay, now I'll go through some of the impacts that these mussels have in the Great Lakes, starting with a few economic impacts. Uh, so these two images just show how the mussels can completely cover and obstruct pipes when they're left in infested waters. And it can cost millions of dollars annually to manage these in the Great Lakes regions. Um, as you consider power plants and water intake systems and commercial fisheries and other equipment in and around the Great Lakes. Um, removing these mussels is labor intensive or takes other intensive treatments such as hot pressurized water or chemical treatments. Um, there are even dive crews that are devoted to 
going down and manually removing these muscles from the walls of locks and dams um, and other equipment. So some of the ecological impacts I'll cover are due to the way these muscles feed. Um, zebra and quagga mussels feed on phytoplankton by filtering it out of the water and each adult mussel can filter up to about a liter of water per day while they feed. And this image here shows just 24 hours of filtration by one or two small clusters of zebra mussels in each tank with this clear water. And so if you apply that to the scale of Lake Michigan, uh, this filter feeding that they do really can alter the nutrients available to the rest of the food web and also makes the water much clearer, which has uh, many repercussions, but I'll just highlight a few here. And so first, uh, mussels are really efficient at feeding, which leads them to outcompete our native mussels and clams in Illinois and the Great Lakes region by removing their food source. And the zebra and quagga mussels can also attach directly to their shells, which can kill them that way as well. Uh, many species of Illinois mussels that were once common in the state have been drastically reduced or even locally extinct. Um, partly due to the spread of invasive mussels. Uh, the second ecological impact I'll touch on comes in the form of avian botulism. And so the clear water that is a result of this filter feeding allows sunlight to reach further into the water column, which um, contributes to the growth, growth of an algae called Cladophora. And when Cladophora dies and decays, it creates an environment for the bacteria which produces the botulism toxin to grow. Um, and as invasive mussels are filtering the water, they're accumulating this toxin, which is then taken up by bottom dwelling fish that might eat them and up the food chain to waterfowl, such as these loons. Um, in 2007, more than 4,000 affected birds from Lake Michigan were reported dead due to this avian botulism. Um, as far as I know, the last major outbreak in Lake Michigan was in 2016, but I believe they're still monitoring this. And the last ecological impact that I'll touch on is this um, trend that invasive muscle, muscle villagers are comprising more and more of the zooplankton population in Lake Michigan. And so these villagers are really dominant species in certain parts of the lakes and researchers confirmed that young fish, such as larval alewife and yellow perch and bloaters, maybe are, are eating more of these, which may be less nutritious for these fish and other larval fish. Um, and this shift in diet could potentially cause these fish to grow more slowly and negatively impact our commercially harvested predator fish that we have in Lake Michigan. And so this food web graphic comes from that tool that I mentioned earlier, that story map. Uh, it just depicts sort of this shift in species composition in Lake Michigan after the invasive mussels have um, established. And so as for recreational impacts, while well, divers and other lake goers might appreciate this clear water, um, the zebra and quagga mussel shells are very sharp and can make swimming or walks on the beach a bit more dangerous. Um, and the mussels also quickly colonize boats that you might leave in the water or other um, recreational equipment that you have, which can do damage to your props and engines, for example. Um, okay, so now I will get into some of our outreach efforts that we have particular, particularly um, as related to invasive mussels and other aquatic invasive species. And so we try to reach the recreational water user communities in many different ways. Uh, and I'll just touch on a few of these, but quickly listed here are some of the things that Busy and Greg have already, have already touched on. Um, our primary outreach campaign is a Be A Hero campaign and particularly Be A Hero Transport Zero focuses on the recreational water user communities. So boaters and anglers and others and really discrete actions that they can take that will help them to stop, uh, to prevent spreading aquatic invasive species. And so for invasive mussels, these would include things like draining the water from your bait bucket and other equipment, 
uh, removing visible plant matter and mud from your boat and thoroughly drying your equipment before taking it to a different waterway. And so we use this logo and messaging on a very wide variety of educational and promotional materials, especially um, at our in-person events. So when we're sitting at a boat launch or at a trade show or hosting workshops. Um, and these are some clips from, of those suggested remove drain dry actions of the Transport Zero campaign. Uh, these are pulled from a PSA type video that Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and partners put together. And so these videos are good for our online outreach efforts for our social media and other campaigns like those. Uh, our outreach also takes the form of surveying, both online and in person. And through some of this research, we found that, well, recreational water users are typically aware of the importance of these removal steps, um, but boat ramps can be busy and stressful and they might not give people the time and space to do these before they leave. And so another approach that we've been taking is to work with boat ramps and marinas to create what we're calling removal zones, uh, which are just designated areas to inspect and clean your boat and trailer and equipment. And so this is a sign um, that's up in Lake County right now to make boaters and anglers aware of these removal steps and of several parking spaces that are meant for boat to tie down and cleaning before they leave for the day. And um, a very different outreach effort that we completed towards the end of last summer is this full vehicle wrap for an Illinois Department of Natural Resources field truck. And this project recently won a creative design award, actually, and we have a ton of people to thank for that. But uh, this truck travels throughout the state during the field work seasons. And as long as it does this, it serves as this um, eye-catching mobile billboard for our Transport Zero campaign and really Zero campaign and uh, invasive species awareness messaging. Um, and you can see it features aquatic invasive species such as hydrilla and silver carp and of course the zebra mussel. And so the future of our, our aquatic invasive species outreach looks similar to what we've previously been doing, but we always are aware of potential changes in the pathways of species introductions or new laws and regulations and changing aud audience demographics, for example. But for now, that is all I've got. Um, Thank you all for listening. And I think we'll take the questions that have been popping up in the chat box. Thank you so much, um, Amanda and, and Greg and Busy all. We have had quite a few questions jump into the, the chat already. And as people are putting new ones in there, um, I'll go ahead and, and read some of the ones that we're, we started with. And I'll start with some of the, the zebra muscle ones here. Um, somebody wrote they assume that mussels did the same thing in their in their native range um, so what's causing uh, the damage that we see to the or are they causing the damage to the pipes and filtering the water uh, and everything that we see here in their native range too that is a great question and i'm actually not too certain on specifics but um i know well part of the thing that makes an invasive species so capable at establishing is the lack of um, predators that are there or other things to keep it in check that are in its native ranges. And so I might expect that if, um, you know, these things have evolved together, they might not be doing the same kind of damage that we see here. But um, yeah, I'm not able to say much more than that right now. Okay. Um, another question about zebra mussels and, and quagga mussels, but kind of even a little bit broader question is somebody uh, states that there's states that have pretty heavily enforced laws against transporting, transporting invasive species, including uh, the mussels. Um, is anyone working here uh, to lobby for stricter invasive species laws in our Great Lakes states? 
Um, I'll take that one. Yeah, so there are laws in Illinois um, that prohibit it, the transportation movement of zebra mussels and quagga mussels. Um, but also there are laws that um, require people to drain the water from their boats and their live wells um, to not move around other uh, things like VHS or viral um, hemorrhagic septicemia, which is a fish disease. And so there are lots of laws that are occurring. Um, and each state is kind of making up their, their own laws at this moment um, on how each state address um, invasive species. All right, great. Um, do mussels attach to the bottom of boats? Yes. Okay. And especially in their, um, as smaller adults, it might be hard to see them, but they have this sort of sandpapery grit feeling. Um, but yes, they do, they do attach to boat bottoms. Okay, and then um, finally, kind of the, the last one on the zebra and quagga mussels that we have so far would be, um, what should somebody do if they find zebra or quagga, mu quagga mussels in their local lake here in Illinois? So there are several resources you can report those to. Um, I believe through Illinois Department of Natural Resources and, um, and others, but I think they typically require um, you to hold on to one of the organisms that you find. So you can put that in a plastic bag to save. Um, but yeah, definitely report it. Greg, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, definitely report it um, if you have photographic evidence. Um, typically, a photograph is sufficient to get someone to come out and take a look. Um, but things like zebra mussels, sometimes it's hard to like, if it's a new infestation, it's of interest. Um, so it's kind of hard to you know, always get the right attention, but yes. Okay, uh, we had several questions about crayfish. Uh, one person wanted to know, how do you go about catching the crayfish and determining if it is native? So we catch the crayfish with the trapping. Um, so we have basically minnow traps that we put bait in. Um, and so you can catch them with that way or with the nets that I showed. Um, and then you need to, to identify the crayfish in order to determine if it's native or invasive. So once you know what species you have and then you know where you found it, you can determine if it's native to that area or invasive to that area. So you can't just say, oh, it's invasive just by looking at it without knowing what it is. You have to really identify it to the species level to understand if it's invasive or native. Okay, great. Um, what's the average lifespan of a crayfish? Um, I think that that is really uh, dependent on the species, but I think they live a few years. They don't really live much longer than like five years, um, and especially being out in the wild, so many things eat them that uh, they don't they don't live too long. So a few years. Uh, going on that things eating them, somebody asked, are all of these different crayfish edible uh, and tasty and is eating them um, part of the control effort? Yeah, so I haven't personally eaten any other species other than the ones that live in the um, southern United States. So I've only eaten like the red swamp crawfish. So I'm not, can't personally say if the ones that are um over here tastes too good, but it definitely is something that some people are, are talking about, about eating the invasive species as a way to control them. Um, and there are some regulations involved um, because you're, depending on where you are, you're not really supposed to transport these species. So um, there can be some rules about um, not transporting it from, from where you get it. And so, um, that gets a little tricky. Maybe Greg can talk more about that, but definitely the red swamp crayfish are yummy. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, for the most part, if it's an injurious species such as rusty crayfish, you can't transport it alive. But... Okay, uh, somebody was asking, they made a comment that they have um, some different species in their pond in their area and, um, if they're worried about invasives or, or controlling some of these, who in the state can they contact for, for resources about controlling invasive plants, uh, aquatic plants in their, in their ponds? 
Yeah, so I think Amanda kind of touched on this with the with the DNR website. I don't know if Greg has, I think Greg unmuted himself to say something also. Yeah, yeah, so um, I guess it really depends on the species and where you are, um, but definitely talking to your local um, uh, land management agency is best, either it's at the county level or at the state level, um, and then they might be able to provide you with some good uh, resources or in the direction of who can help you with that. So sometimes it's up to lake management associations, um, et cetera, to uh, deal with some of those issues. All righty. Uh, does anything kill zebra mussels? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, yeah, there are chemical treatments and um, very hot water and they can't survive in certain salinity contents. Um, very few things eat them here though, especially humans can't eat them. Um, the round goby, which is another invasive species will eat them, but uh, they're pretty hardy species. Um, I just want to add that one of the reasons why we recommend boaters take their boats out of the water um, to dry for five days is to kill zebra mussel villagers on the outside of their boats. So drying temperatures will also kill the young um, after a while. Okay. Um, the last one we have coming in so far uh, is a question about snakehead in Illinois. Uh, are there snakeheads here? Um, not that I have heard of. I've heard of um, one or two individuals um, being caught, but never a uh, reproductive population being found in Illinois. Um, often bowfin or dogfish are often mistaken for them. Um, and so we do hear occasionally like people talk about those, but never a snakehead population that I know of. Okay, uh, we had another question come in here that's I think it's a really good one. Uh, do local bait shops still sell rusty crayfish or are they promoting the use of native bait? So there's a couple places in Chicago that have been grandfathered in that you can buy dead rusty crayfish, but for the most part you can't sell them otherwise. Um, and as far as promoting native bait, um, I'm not unsure of that one. Okay. Uh, what about the use of bleach or something on boats to kill the vel villagers? Is that necessary or is it just the drying that you recommend? Um, I mean, the drying is a, a good way to prevent people from pouring bleach into their local aquatic systems. Um, I don't think it's necessary if you're taking those other prevention steps. Okay, great. Well, it is, uh, it's two o'clock here. So I think we're gonna go ahead and um, I wanna thank you all for, for the, the wonderful presentation. Thank everybody else for uh, attending and I hope to see everybody um, tomorrow. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all.